I'm going to tell you a story, and it's one I tell a lot when I talk about implicit bias. But listen carefully, because there's a piece missing from my story, and that missing piece is why I'm standing here today. So I came to America when I was 17 years old. I grew up in the Caribbean, and I came here and I went to Princeton, I went to Michigan Law, and on the first day of law school, I met my husband. We dated, we went on The Price is Right, we got married, and we moved to Chicago. Now, I am black, surprise, and my husband's white. We have two daughters, and because my husband is white and I'm black, our daughters look very white. They could pass for white. We live on the north side of Chicago, which is predominantly white. And when I'm walking around my neighborhood with my daughters, when I'm in the park, when I'm at the store, when I'm at the restaurant, and especially when I'm at the playground, I am always assumed, always assumed, by some well-meaning white moms to be my children's nanny. And then I'm asked questions like, how much am I paid? Am I looking for work? Are my friends looking for work? You guys would be shocked by how many moms on the north side of Chicago are trying to steal nannies. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the Hunger Games of nannies out there. So that's the story I tell when I talk about implicit bias. And I tell people it's because our brain receives millions of bits of information every second of the day. And it needs an automatic way to process that information, to filter it, to break it into little pieces that fit. Now one theory on how your brain does this is through two systems of the brain, system one and system two. System one is that fast, automatic, intuitive part of the brain the part of the brain that makes conclusions about everyone and everything. It's your brain on autopilot, and it filters 99% of the information coming at you. Now system two is slower, calm, collected, reflective, but it takes a while to kick in. And even when it does, it relies heavily on what system one is telling it. So system one thinking is what those moms in my neighborhood are doing. She is a black woman. Black women in my neighborhood are nannies. She is a nanny. Because otherwise, she doesn't fit. Her story doesn't fit. So I do these talks, and then one day I'm talking to my children's nanny, who is a black woman, and I tell her about this, and she says, yeah. But you know, most of the time, they don't even talk to us. And I stop short, because that's the missing piece of the story. See, it's not just what those well-meaning white moms say. It's what they don't say. It's when they don't sit next to you in the park. It's when they walk right past you without making eye contact. It's when they turn away and don't include you in conversations. It's when they treat you like a stranger who doesn't fit, like a stranger who doesn't belong. See, implicit bias tells you a lot. Implicit bias tells you that you have biases, that you should be aware of your biases. It tells you how to interrupt them, how to make sure how to structure around them. But you know what implicit bias doesn't tell you? It doesn't tell you why you have those biases in particular. It doesn't tell you that those biases are wrong, and most of all, it doesn't tell you how to end them. Because how to end them, well, that's a much harder conversation. See, we're missing a piece, and that's what I want to talk about next. So one of my favorite books is a book called Americana. Americana tells the story of a Nigerian immigrant. Her name is Ifemelu, and in the part of the story that I'm going to tell, Ifemelu is going into a store to buy a dress, and she's with her friend Ganika, who's also Nigerian, but has been in the States a bit longer than Ifemelu has. So they're in this store, and there are three sales clerks in the store. There's two on the floor, and one at the cash register. Of the two on the floor, one sales clerk is black and one sales clerk is white. The woman at the register, she is white. So Ganika and Ephemelu, they find a dress. The white woman on the floor is the one who helps them. Then they go to checkout. And the white cashier asks Ganika which of the two clerks helped them. So Ganika looks around. She doesn't see either woman. She doesn't know either of their names. So here's the conversation that follows. 
Was it the one with the long hair, the cashier asks? Well, both of them had long hair, Ganika replies. Ganika's not gonna be helpful here. Was it the one with the dark hair, the cashier asks? Well, both of them had dark hair, Ganika thinks. So Ganika smiles and she looks at the cashier and the cashier smiles and she looks at her computer screen and two seconds crawl past before the cashier cheerfully says it's okay. I'll figure it out later and make sure she gets her commission. So Ganika and Ephemalu, they walk out to the store and Ephemalu turns to Ganika and asks, I don't understand. Why didn't she just ask if it was the white girl or the black girl? And Ganika laughs and she says, because this is America. And in America, you're supposed to pretend you don't notice certain things. That conversation, that's the heart of what I'm talking about. That's the missing piece. See, those white moms may have made their initial assumptions about me because of implicit bias, but their decision to not talk to me, to not talk to my black nanny, that's not implicit bias. Any more than the decision to call the police on black people who are barbecuing in the park, or dancing at the beach, or sitting in a coffee shop, any more than any of that is implicit bias. That's all about race. Race is the missing piece. And race is the piece that we don't want to talk about in America. Because Americans, especially white Americans, just don't like talking about race. Why is that? Because in this multicultural, rich tapestry of a country in which we live, Americans have been raised to think one thing when it comes to race, to be colorblind. See, America is this great melting pot, right? This wonderful melting pot of a country. And the ideal is this. We all come in with our many different ethnicities and identities and cultures and religions, and we all combine them into this one great melting pot, and out of it emerges this unified American identity. That's one interpretation. But here's the other. An actual melting pot is where you go in, and you melt away all the differences and all the characteristics that make individuals unique, and you just make them the same. And so that melting pot ideal of America, that colorblind ideal, it means that a lot of us try to be like that cashier in Americana. We try not to talk about race, not to talk about difference. So what do we do? We call it merit. We call it coincidence. We call it just the way things are. We call it, we just don't have anything in common. We call it girl with the long hair but we just don't call it race. Do you recognize this game? It's Guess Who, right? And yes, that is what the original Guess Who board looked like. <laughs> so in Guess Who, a lot of you know, you have a set of pictures, your partner has a set of pictures, and your goal is to identify what picture your partner's holding in their hand, right? Your opponent's holding in their hand. And you do that by asking yes or no questions. For example, does your person have blue eyes? Does your person have blonde hair? So fast forward to 2006. Researchers recreate Guess Who, but instead of using this board, they use this board. Half the faces are white faces, half the faces are black faces, and researchers ask their 30 white participants to play Guess Who with this board. Now, I talk about race a lot, right? And I want to win. So of course I would ask, is your person black? But that question, is your person black? Only 57% of the white participants even asked that question. And even worse, only 21% of them asked that question when they were playing with a black partner. And when they did that, they appeared uncomfortable, anxious. They like did the opposite of the power pose. Why? Because they were worried that they would appear racist. You know who did much better at this test? Third graders. And you know who did just as bad? Fourth and fifth graders. That colorblindness, that realization that you can't talk about race, that sets in as early as age 10. But now I want you guys to do a test. I want to know how colorblind your world is really. So I want you to picture something for me. Picture a circle. And that circle is broken into different puzzle pieces, about, let's say, 15 or 16 of them, kind of like that. And what I'm going to ask you to do is color in your world. Color in those pieces. Color them in with these colors. 
we're going to roughly use these ethnic and racial groups here. So we're going to say green for Asian, black for black, pink, red for Hawaiian Pacific Islander, orange for Hispanic, Latinx, Middle Eastern, North African is blue, yellow for Native American, and white for white. And then I'm going to give you some race, some names, some categories. And what I want you to do is fill in your world. Fill in your circle. Fill in those puzzle pieces. And be honest with yourself. No one is seeing this except for you. Let's start with you. Then let's do the neighborhood you grew up in. Fill out your puzzle pieces. Your childhood best friend. Your favorite teacher in elementary school. The author of your favorite book as a child. Your first boss. Your first crush. If you went to college, your best friend in college. Your favorite professor in college. If you have one, your significant other or your spouse. Your last one, if you still like them. Your next one, if you're hopeful. <laughs> now let's think about you right now. Your current neighborhood, where you live right now. Fill out your puzzle pieces. Your closest neighbor, the one that you'd borrow sugar from. The star of your favorite movie. Let's finish it up. Your doctor. Your dentist. Your mayor. And your president. Now take a look at your world for me, OK? Look at your world. Look at the colors in your world. Are you surprised by it? Are you disappointed in it? Are you pleased with it? Most of all, ask yourself, is this what a colorblind world should look like? See, I'm not asking you to go out and find yourself like three black friends, right? <laughs> but what I am asking you to do is to be cognizant of how not colorblind your world is, how the choices your parents made, the choices that you make, and the choices that many of us make for our children how very much centered on race they are. Because it's only once you realize it that you can start to change it. So let's change it. Step one is recognizing it. And step two is going to be a little bit harder. Because for step two, we have to recognize the world in which we live. This is the world in which we live, in which our cities are segregated, our neighborhoods are segregated, our schools are segregated. And because of that, do you know what else is segregated? Our social circles. The average white American has 91 white friends and one black friend. 75% of white Americans have no friends of color at all. 75%. So what do we need to do if we really want to transform our colorblind world? We need to get out of our silos. We need to get uncomfortable. And here's what I mean by that. I once had a conversation with a white friend who said that she could never go into a black church because she would feel uncomfortable. And I said, I understood. Because I have been in more all white churches than I can name. And all white conference rooms, and all white weddings, and all white bars, and all white baseball games, and all white PTA meetings, and all white playgrounds, and all white offices. Minorities live and breathe in majority spaces. If you really want to transform your world, try doing the same. Enter a space where you're not the majority. Visit neighborhoods, respectfully, that are primarily minority. Read books by diverse authors, where the main characters aren't people who look like you. Browse websites based around identities other than your own. And here's the thing. You are going to feel uncomfortable. You really are. But when you do, lean into that discomfort. Grow from that discomfort, because then we're going to take it up to step three. And step three is this. Step three is when you end the color blindness around you as well. Because here's the thing about minorities in your spaces, and those bars, and those weddings, and those restaurants, all those all white spaces that we enter. A lot of us go in, and we wear a mask. We hide our true colors. We hide our true identities. You know why? Because we want to fit in, too. And so this is what step three is. Step three is ending that masking. 
I had a conversation with another white friend. I talk about race a lot. I have a lot of conversations with white people, right? And this time we were talking about how he said that he would rather be born black in this country than white. And I was like, okay, where do I start with this? <laughs> and then he's like, no, 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 stop, because here's the thing. I just want to be him. And that him is who I call Kevin from Yale. Kevin from Yale, Kevin from Yale. Kevin from Yale is the successful black man. Kevin from Yale is class president, valedictorian, first in his class. Now he's company vice president. He is so cool. Everyone wants to hang with Kevin from Yale. He doesn't have any of those old racial hangups. He is just awesome. I don't care that Kevin from Yale is black. Don't call me color blank. Is Kevin from Yale? He's just like me. So Kevin from Yale is probably a really nice guy. But do you know how Kevin from Yale feels every time he walks into a room and he's the only black face there? Do you know how Kevin from Yale feels when he walks into a meeting and realizes that he needs to represent every single black male professional out there? Because Kevin from Yale, he is the one black friend. Do you know the mental toll it takes on Kevin from Yale to be Kevin from Yale and to have been Kevin from Yale every single day of his professional life? Because to wobble for even a second on that tightrope that he's walking on is to have someone turn to him and think implicitly or explicitly, oh, I guess he's just like the rest of them. You see Kevin from Yale, I see a man who has to work hard every day to wear that mask in the workplace. And so that's what step three is. Step three is creating authentic spaces where people like Kevin from Yale can take off their masks and feel like they belong. How do you do that? You're all leaders, every one of you. And in every space you lead, create a culture of authenticity for all of your organizations. Talk about your life outside of your organization. Talk about your struggles, your successes, your victories. Talk about your truths. Encourage a culture of upstanding, where if someone sees something problematic, they're empowered to talk about it, to stand up, to speak out about it. Recognize people for their accomplishments. Ensure that every voice is heard in meetings. And most of all, and this is the most important part. Create spaces where everyone can share their stories, both the ones that are the majority narrative and the ones that aren't. For example, I grew up playing travel hockey every single weekend in the Chicago suburbs. Or I grew up going to Indian weddings every single weekend in the Chicago suburbs. Or I grew up with six siblings and a single mom in a one-bedroom apartment in the city. I got married to my college sweetheart too, but I had to wait until the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage. I have two kids, and it is so hard when I have to miss their school activities. I pray five times a day, and I do it in that room right over there. Implicit bias isn't enough. Talking about implicit bias isn't enough. If we want to truly move forward on inclusion in this country, what we're going to have to do is create spaces of color, of vibrant, authentic, honest color. I started with my story, so I'm going to end with it. I came to America when I was 17 years old. I have now been in America longer than I ever was in the Caribbean. I love this country, I love this country. And five years ago, I became a citizen. One of the happiest moments of my life. Because what that ceremony guaranteed me was this. I belonged here. We need to take that into our schools, into our classrooms, into our religious institutions, into our communities, into our playgrounds. We need to work at creating authentic spaces where people can enter, be seen for their true selves, and be confidently told this truth. You belong here.
We are a country that is 40% people of color. We need to engage with the truths about all of those colors. And those truths are beautiful and staggering and heartbreaking and tragic and bright. And they cannot be melted away. America is not a melting pot. America is this. America is a mosaic where all of us, with our many different pieces, where we all fit together, where we all fit here, where we all belong here. Thank you.